Hey guys, it's Sai, and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation. Uh, at the channel, you can find podcasts, interviews, and content on all sorts of subjects, including mental health, football, music, films, Marvel, conspiracy theories. Uh, we do shows and everything, basically. Uh, you can find video uh, video versions of all the interviews on the YouTube channel and social media, and you can also find audio on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, all your usual stuff. Uh, so I've done previously, we've done a few different shows on mental health. I, I did the, what we try to do with the mental health ones is I try to do the, from a different point of view. So yeah, like a medical point of view or the parent's point of view or a patient's point of view. We've done um, one on ADHD, or a few on ADHD. We've done one on depression and grief, uh, which touched a bit on uh, addiction. Um, we also did one on bipolar. Uh, so today is the first in a sort of new series of stuff which I was trying to put together, which was mental health and sport. Uh, so we're going to interview some ex-footballers, some ex-athletes, some medical professionals, some journalists, uh, and try and discuss it and get a little bit of a input into that. So today's guest is a sports psychologist, a lecturer, uh, former semi-professional footballer, uh, Tracy Donaghy, welcome to the show. Sorry, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. So, uh, so everyone's gonna. I'm gonna be looking down, and it looks really weird. It's because I <laughs> had to do a little bit of switcheroo with my phone and my laptop to get Skype to work for myself today. Uh, so it's gonna look a bit strange, but there's not a lot I can do about that, unfortunately. Um, so obviously, like mental health is a hot topic anyway worldwide particularly in the uk at the moment there's a lot of people trying to raise awareness which is obviously a good thing um i think it's a very complex subject anyway um and there's intricacies in all aspects of it i find the mental health in sport one particularly interesting because there's so many different aspects to it where you've got like the sort of top level um and they put pressure on themselves every week to be perfect and then you've got sort of the the clubs and the the manager and the coaches and things like that who are putting pressure on them to do it. But then you've also got the the fans and the crowds. And then I think social media adds like an extra bit of pressure, particularly um, you know for young players if they have a negative performance, they know about it straight away by hundred from hundreds of people. Um, so it is something which I'm you know I want to look into from all different aspects. Um, so we'll sort of start with like top level sport and football. Um, I say football is just because a lot of the people I speak going to speak to, are, you know, from a football background, but it you know it applies to all sport really in terms of it could be boxing, fighting, rugby. It's all the same, you know, pressure at the top, very top level uh, to perform, you know, every week as you were. So. Just quickly, if you could tell us, I wanted uh, something which caught my eye on your website particularly, and I can't remember the, the exact uh, p- performance psychology. Could you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, so um, I completed my master's in performance psychology um, and I started working with athletes um, after get, getting that qualification. And um, particularly in football, um, I started to find that... In, young people you know 15 16 years old that I was working with um were starting to suffer from issues of mental health um but mainly because they had probably been very very good and then they get and played elite and then when they get to 15 16 there's more of a challenge for them and they were no longer able to have perfect performances um so when working with athletes I found this reoccurring theme that um, individuals if they didn't have a perfect performance they would beat themselves up they would be annoyed um, and they would dwell on their performance throughout the week so even if they had played a great game on the Sunday um, I would maybe have a performance psychology session with them on the Wednesday um, and they would be still ruminating about their performance so I had one individual who saved a penalty penalty kick so you'd think that's amazing but actually because she didn't save the penalty kick in a perfect way then she was still thinking about it and anxious 
going into training and worrying about what people thought of her and different things like that. Um, so my role as performance psychologist, um, trying to look at individuals and their well-being and in turn I think if people feel good about themselves then that will in turn help their performance. Um, so from that experience I started to get interested in um, perfectionism and how when you have really high standards for yourself but you're very self-critical how that impacts your mental health and your psychological well-being um, and that's where, where I try to use my performance psychology to help um, individuals mainly football but I have worked across a number of sports um, and that's when I got interested in my PhD because I could see there was a problem within football and I wanted to find out how I could help. Yeah it's a really it's a fascinating subject because like particularly the, the kids one sort of sticks with me personally because I've got a 14 year old who plays academy football and he's been in sort of around that level since he was about nine and my youngest who's 10 is sort of just in the sort of development sort of sides underneath that um and particularly my older boy he's a goalkeeper and he put so much pressure on himself and what we found is he played for Cardiff city development teams who was like just under the academy and what we found is every time he went for a trial like he's been for trials for this the county or different clubs is he put himself under so much pressure even at just like 11 or 12 it was like oh if I mess up today I'm never going to be a professional footballer and my life's over and it you know goalkeepers press pressure position anyway because you get the blame for everything and you blame yourself for everything um so now he's sort of he, he's in like a Welsh league academy which is a lower level but I think he's a bit more comfortable but it took a good few years of trying to explain to him that perhaps just work on being the best you can be and developing yourself and that type of thing. But he spent a good, I'd say, two or three years from about nine to sort of 12, where it was a real problem for him that he was putting so much pressure on himself that he was never going to be able to cope with those pressures and expectations that he was putting on himself. And I, th it's, I find it really fascinating because... For a child, you'd think, you know, just go and play football. Yeah. But obviously, there's, when they get to like a level where they're being picked for their performance, they think, oh, Cardiff City, I want, I'm going to be a professional footballer now. Mm -hmm. And perhaps don't take into account all the millions of factors which come into it between then and, you know, 16, 17. Um, yeah. And I think the, with the academy, it's very difficult because... The, I mean, studies show it's like 1% of footballers, even in an academy set up, will make it. So there is that pressure that you're probably maybe not going to make it, but you have your hopes set on it and you think that every mistake um, will contribute to not making it. Every um, performance is, you know, you're putting the hopes on becoming professional or keeping your contract. And I think that's where it's very difficult for for players and there's you know there's lots of um stuff that shows that academies can be quite harsh um you know as far as rejection of players yeah. um players getting dropped or um and i know within my re research um you know there's one study that's out there that looks at academy players from 15 to 18 year olds and um almost half of them who were rejected were experiencing anxiety and depression like 21 days after they um they were dropped or rejected from the club which is a huge amount um of young people that are going to get re rejected and um, so if you think that half of them are go perhaps going to be experiencing anxiety and depression there's a lot of kids out there and those are the ones that might be the ones who drop out of sport and then we don't have them anymore to to help and deliver performance psychology to because they've decided that they're not good enough because they've not made it an academy. Yeah, and I think <sighs> a bit a big a big it's a it's a bit of a knife edge for the football clubs in a way because mm -hmm. they're obviously trying to find players who can go on to be professionals and, you know, find the next star and whatever. But obviously at this sort of age of like fourteen to sixteen, seventeen, they're not 
you know, they are interested, they want them to play and they want to try and pick the best players that they can find around their regions. <clears throat> but what they don't really, you know, they reject it. They reject who they reject and they keep who they keep. They don't really concern themselves with the players who they reject because mm -hmm. it's almost like, right, well, you're not my problem anymore. And of yeah. course, like you say, that's a really high percentage of, you know, essentially kids and it's like, you know they might be sort of 17 18 some of them but they're still kids um who you know that can have a real if you've trained in an academy from i don't know seven and you've gone all the way up to sort of six 16 17 18 and then when it comes to the time where they sort of take you on in, as in a professional sort of thing where you're going to get paid or you're going to go and train with them full time and then they tell you oh no you're not good enough that's going to have a huge impact on where your life goes, you know, and some of them it will only affect, you know, maybe in the short term, it'll take them a month or two just to sort of get their head together or get around, you know, thinking, oh, there's other things I can do. But then how many of them are then going on and having further issues with sort of depression or anxiety or, you know, anything else because they've got that, their first sort of experience of working life is rejection and being told you know you're not good enough mm. it's it's a difficult navigation i think yeah and i think because a lot of the times well the players that i've worked with and particularly even from the age of you know 10 11 their whole identity is fixed on being a footballer so that's all they know themselves as and that's what they're known as probably within their school within their um, social groups as in we Johnny the footballer he plays for whatever team yeah. and so their whole identity is fixed on that and they don't know any other parts of themselves um, and I think that's when it becomes an issue because once that's maybe taken away or you're not the best at your identity then it comes with the issues of you know more negative emotions um, and it's I guess for performance psychology for me, it's trying to get an individual to understand their strengths as a person and not just as a performer. So then if they do face rejection, they know that they have um, their kindness or their humour or their um, compassion towards others and that they've got these parts of themselves that are are more important than whether they can kick a ball 100 yards. <laughs> so um... Yeah, and I think as well, the, the impact that it can have on the younger sort of the younger ones self-esteem is a big issue because obviously quite often when you get to the sort of the full academy certainly in my area is when these kids even at sort of there was a boy who played for my son's team and he played up to under eight and because he was so good he was no longer allowed to play for the park uh, for the you know just for the Saturday team and he's no longer allowed to go on certain school trips and he's no longer allowed to play I think it was school games. He's only allowed to sort of play at a certain level yeah. because he's so good. But of course, that has its own self-esteem issues because then they never try any other sports. They never they miss out on the social aspect of football on a Saturday morning and doing all those things. Of course, they still get that to a certain degree in an academy. But I can tell you, the football for under tens playing on a Saturday with their mates and playing on a mm. Sunday or a Saturday with the academy is a very, very di different atmosphere. Um, you know, they on a Saturday is more about sort of camaraderie and team spirit and making friends and having fun, whereas the other side of it is <clears throat> more about playing well and winning the game and doing certain things. So, you know, I'm sure they still have fun to a certain extent, but it's very different. Mm. So if that's all you know from under sevens or under eights and then suddenly in your teenage years which are hard enough as it is you're then told oh no you're not, not good enough anymore because everyone else has caught up to you because everyone learns in you know and everyone develops at different ages and different speeds so it's very difficult to you can't go back can you as, a, as so if what i'm saying is if that child spent his say 10 years not doing, not being allowed to do other stuff or not being allowed to go on certain trips. They can't go back and do those things and they've lost yeah. out on that stuff. So it's almost like, like as a parent, it's very difficult to 
like you want if they get picked for things you want them to do well and you want them to you know enjoy it and develop but also you want them to enjoy it and have fun yeah. because that develops different aspects of their personality and you know I don't know it's very difficult I find it I find it difficult and like <clears throat> my short children are not quite at the elite level they're just sort of just underneath and doing very well and I like it that way because they're just focused on developing themselves but I've seen parents from other parts which are in the higher level or want to be in the higher level and they're very different they themselves yeah. put a lot of pressure on their kids it's almost like they're living vicariously through their children as well which yeah. I think is another aspect of it is the sort of almost parental pressure to push their kids on to you know pursue like a football career or whatever it may be and again how many of those kids get the care from afterwards particularly younger kids I'm thinking of like you know like you're sort of 12 to 14 or 15 year olds who are in school it's mm -hmm. very you know those time, those years are very hard anyway yeah <laughs> they're not pleasant a lot of the time so I think that I do think it's a real issue in terms of you know like you say there's millions of kids who want to be professional footballers and a very small percentage of them do it which means there's a very high percentage of kids who are going to have a big knock on their self-esteem or going to have a high level of anxiety and mental health maybe not you know like fully fledged sort of mental health problems if you like but it's a it's an issue which will probably need to be dealt with in some way yeah and i think um so we we'll look at something called perfectionistic reactivity. So it's when things don't go well, how do we respond? And the people that I've spoken to, if they've always been really good, so like you're saying that eight year old, like he's always been good, he's always been seen as the best. And then he goes into a team where he's not the best and everyone around him is good. So I found with individuals, they find that the most difficult because there was a chance of them being almost perfect at what they do. And then the reaction to not being the best anymore is what then impacts their self-esteem and things like that and I know from when I played when I first started I was terrible I was absolutely an awful player my coach told me I was rotten and that I would never make it because I just ran around like a headless chicken um, but what I learned was that um, I was able to be resilient from getting beat and the team that I played for I had to play up so because of my birthday so I was playing under 16s at let's say 14 and I was terrible and we were losing 22-0 and um, I think we lost 33-0 once and um, so we I learned how to get an absolute hammering um, and I learned to be pretty crap so by the time it got to 16 and I had to work hard my team did so well we were winning like the league the cup and, and doing really well but it was from having that um those things that made me think, well, I have to keep working hard and yeah. um, and making, making me a little bit more resilient. Um, that's given me that. But I, I just uh, think about the kids who have always been the best or always been in the best team. And then when they aren't, what happens then? And what support do we have? And can we find ways to um, challenge kids at a younger age, but not to the point where they're breaking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's like a, finding that sort of happy medium, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> so, if we just sort of switch away from kids slightly um, and towards the very sort of top uh, top tier or a higher echelon of the like football and sport, obviously there's a tremendous amount of pressure which comes with being a professional sportsman. Um, and like particularly in football, the, the sort of prime age or when players tend to be at their best is between sort of 20 and 30. So they have to deal with a, this sort of day-to-day -day pressure, the training, um, it's obviously very physical and demanding. Um, and like I mentioned before, the pressure from the club and the coaches and the fans. Um, obviously, that's a lot to deal with at a very young age. For instance, like I often think back to when I was in my early 20s and I don't think I'd coped very well with like being a professional footballer or a professional sportsman in the way the world is now 
because of things like social media and stuff. I'd have been in the papers every week because I'd have been arguing with the fans or something. Because, <laughs> but like, because I was 20 or, you know, young and impulsive. And I think that's a tremendous amount of pressure. And I think of some of these players who just must be feel like the pressure just builds and builds and builds. And then particularly if they have hit a bad run of form or they're unsettled at the club they're at and the fans are on their back, it can be quite a toxic atmosphere, but they've still got to go to work and they've still got to go and train and they've still got to do, you know, and they've got to go out and about in the city centre. Obviously, they're done and dusted their work day by lunchtime. They've got to do something and they can't just lock themselves away in the houses. So then if they're going out with their families or something and they see some fans, they can perhaps sometimes say something. Or you've got the other side of it with the, the media constantly following them around. Like, do you, or how, do you think clubs are doing enough in terms of caring for the players, make sure that they're coping with the mental health side of it? Um, I think there's probably always more that clubs can do um, as far as resources and like you said um, players at that level are in the limelight of everyone all the time and they have to put on a show when they go to training that they're happy you know da, 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 then they're out um, they have to put on this show again and then when they get behind closed doors maybe that's when they you know release and they yeah. can just be themselves and I think we, you know, I, I would hope that, you know, clubs are starting to invest in sports psychologists and performance psychologists to help individuals cope with all those aspects and not just, you know, what, how someone performs in, on the pitch. Um, there's so many aspects of sport and particularly when you get to that higher level, you know, the difference between one player and another is normally the psychological side of, of that, whether you can cope with the pressures, whether you can cope with you know the pressure of the fans and um and particularly at 18 20 you know usually at that age you, you have the pressures already of you know setting your exams doing all these things having to uh, get jobs all these things but then if you add on top of you know you're playing in front of maybe 50,000 people and they're screaming and shouting at you because you've made a mistake or you've got a coach who is screaming and shouting at you um so i think those things um I'm really big on coach education and how to um, coach, how coaches can empower their players um, by using, you know, effective communication and ways to empower people to make them feel good rather than just screaming and shouting at them for making mistakes. And I, the, I think the problem that I have is when I run coach education, I get all the coaches who are doing the right thing and they're great communicators but, and they're turning up to coach education and psychology um but for those who perhaps are more disempowering to individuals i'm not getting those getting those in and it's mm. finding a way to educate um all coaches but i think a lot of you know organizations are doing a lot more there's a lot more awareness in mental health and a lot more um mental health awareness training which i think is is great i know in scotland a lot of clubs are getting chaplains um maybe staying away from more of the sports psychology side but getting chaplains in which is another step you know closer to people getting support um so ideally i would hope that you know every sports team can have a full-time sports psychologist to help um help players um yeah and i think in the long long term it's only gonna <clears throat> it'll only benefit those clubs to make sure that the the players have got the support they need i mean do you think that, obviously, the amount of sort of pressure, and it can be like a big build-up of pressure into in, in these sort of issues around football or sport, or even things like boxing and fighting, where you have like an intense training camp before a big fight, the fighters are intense training and they're doing media and it's very much in this sort of bubble. But obviously, they're all quite short careers. In terms of by your mid thirties, you tend to be done and dusted. Do you think that the amount of pressure um, and almost the strain and stress 
of those sort of 10 or 15 years of sort of sport, professional sport at the highest level, do you feel like that contributes then to why we see so many sportsmen who struggle sort of after their careers are over with, with mental health issues? Yeah, well, I mean, now we're getting a lot of research that's um, telling us that people who are footballers that are retired or um, having issues of anxiety, depression, uh, smoking, alcohol, gambling. So there's a lot more research, but you're right that they're thrown into this very intense environment for, you know, 10, 15 years, um, if they're lucky. And then we're not, maybe they're not prepared for afterwards. I think it's like once they get to the end, it's like what else? Whereas if we start to embed like um, training of how to invest money or um, ways that you can grow your own business afterwards or um, coaching badges or things like this so that then when someone's career is over, um, then they've they've been they've been trained because especially because especially for retired people who have been um put out of sport for injury um or rejection then they've got another element to to add that they haven't ran the course of it so they maybe haven't had closure and they also haven't had the training because it's like we are very um instant gratification aren't we we want it we know the we want to know the here and now and what we're doing now and what contract we're getting but we don't think about yeah. as far forward um especially if you already have your hopes on like well i've got a contract and i'm going to be professional and that's it so what why would i do anything else um so i think it's important that we that we still have people being educated um or learning like other skills that, so that when they're finished that whole world hasn't disappeared like they've lost the the highs and the lows of competition they lose that social network they lose like the feeling of competence of like doing well um they just lose that interaction with people so it's a huge step to go from playing professional to not playing yeah to nothing i think what well, something you mentioned there sort of um, made me think is the management of money um, particularly for these very young players who are sort of literally 16, 17 in you know the Premier League or in the top tiers of the game, they go from being on like an apprentice apprentice wage, which I think the last time I looked, the apprentice wage in football is quite similar to just a normal apprentice wage. It's not a great deal of difference, and then all of a sudden they go to the they get into the first teams. They're earning what most people earn in a year, in a week. <laughs> and I think that could be daunting. You know, trying to suddenly think you're 17, you've got all this money, you want to buy a house for your mum and you buy a house for yourself with a pool. And I know it sounds like to normal people, it sounds like, oh, I wish I'd had that worry. But that's like another added strain. And if, mm. like you say, if those players then get injured at 22 and their career's over and they've blown all their money because they thought, well, even if I do this for 10 years, I've got X million, so I'm never going to run out. And then suddenly their career's cut short. I think helping them to manage, not telling them what they can spend it on and what they can't, but it's about helping them do things like, making sure that they're paying all their bills, making sure they're doing their taxes, making sure, because I didn't know how to do any of those things at 17. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and I didn't have the money to do them either. But if you suddenly got a load of money, there's all, you've got all the people who are going to come out of the woodworks who are going to be like with their hand out, which I'm sure they get, you know, they get plenty of those. But also because they're getting so much, they've got to do things like tax returns and stuff. So I think that's something which could be done, you know, I think that should be almost compulsory for all clubs to do for, you know, for a certain age of players. Like, obviously, you don't want to be sort of telling the 28-year-olds what to do. But, like, you know, for those young players, you know, there's a few in the, the Premier League at the moment who are literally just turned 17. And then all of a sudden, they're getting thousands of pounds per week. If they blow that money and something happens, their mental health is only going to go one way. Whereas yes. if 
if they're a bit more prepared and something you know bad happens and their career ends, yes, they'll be depressed or they might have some mental health issues to to get over initially over the retirement, but at least they won't almost go on a free fall because they've spent the millions of pounds they've earned for the four years they've been playing or whatever it may be. So that's I think that's an interesting part to it that perhaps clubs should and could do more of. Yeah, and I think also if you think about the financial aspect of earning so much money, you know, people that play at the top, you know, there's that added pressure. So people th- think that you're earning so much money, wh- wh- how can you not feel good? Like, how can you have depression? How can you have anxiety? But that actually probably is an added pressure because you are earning so much money and we know that money doesn't buy happiness and within professional football I know that there's uh, prestige on um, someone at university looked at professional footballers and and money for their their PhD and it becomes a pressure within the teams as in like and if if you read books from professional footballers they'll say like when they were earning not so much money and they rocked up in their not so nice car the feeling of anxiety they had compared mm. to someone who had their Merc or their fancy car. And so that then became, uh, it was almost a sign of status within, yeah. within, cl- within clubs. Um, whether you're, so, so someone mentioned about whether they had a toilet bag, whether it was, you know, a Gucci toilet bag, you know, mm. for all this money. So it then becomes about status and how much you have. And, that's and I think this is a probably pro- problem with society is that we think by having all these nice things we get get that satisfaction and we feel good about ourselves, but it's only an instant like thing, and we have to then teach people to feel good within and not about what they have. Um, and it's that thing that I think it's just that assumption that if you have things that you're happy, and that's not always the case. You can have everything and it not be ha- happy. Um, so if we can address that underpinning thing that people have self-love and self-compassion and feel good, then we won't need so much stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I think it's like um, people always want more. So if they, they want, and I'd imagine with all that money, it's almost a case of who's got the latest car, the latest watches, the latest clothes, and this, that, and the other. But realistically, like using the example again of retiring is if they do get an injury or they would have to retire for some reason those cars or clothes or whatever it may be they won't matter because yeah. they can't you know they have it's not like they've got this big huge resale value where they can you know they retain their value and they can resell it to steady their finances because they've lost this big contract um so yeah, I think you're right. It take there's there's different aspects to the mental health pressures on them, brought on by their by the sheer amount of money which they earn. So I think yeah, having someone or someone available to them at the club, particularly the young players, to just perhaps talk them through buying a house, setting up bills, making sure you've got your taxes right. That's only going to be a good thing. Yes, mm-hmm. they. There may be a few of them who might resent it a little bit and be like, think a bit like, well, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a child. But mm-hmm. in the long term, I think it's only going to be a good thing. Um, and again, it's it's preparing them for life after sport because whatever sport it is, you don't see many professional sports people still going at fifty. Mm-hmm. So. Like you say, it's about whether it's investments or starting up a coaching academy or just things that they can do within the game, do their coaching badges, do work in the community, like with the kids and coaching and um, like work in the community or charity work, whatever it may be to prepare them for life after their professional sports career ends is a good thing. Mm. And I'm sure there's some players or people who you know they're not interested in that they just want to they'll tackle it when it comes but sometimes life can mean that the things that you want to put off can happen to you very quickly so if they can 
have that support through the clubs on a day-to-day basis, even if it's just someone within the club who they can, they know oh, that person's there. If I need to go and just chat through some stuff, I can go and do it, and it won't be like this big, huge thing where the manager knows. And do you know what I mean? They, yeah. It's almost just like having, not like a counselor, but like just like you said about the chaplain. It's just having that option for them to be able to go and if something's getting on top of them or if they're struggling. Because in my opinion, I think it's only, sadly, and it's really sad, but I think it's only a matter of time before a current or young footballer ends up trying to or killing themselves during their career, simply because I think there's a lot of toxic stuff on the negative side of like football fans and football and the pressures. And I just think that, I think do think it's only a matter of time because everything is so instant mm-hmm. with social media. And I just think things can spiral really, really quickly. Um, yeah. And I do worry about that, I gotta be honest. Well, well I mean, there's, you know, there's quite a few cases which is very, very sad. And, um, you know, one of the examples that I use quite a lot in my PhD is the example of Robert Enka and yeah. um, the goalkeeper and if you read his his book you can see examples of him being very perfectionistic and suffering from anxiety around um, not being perfect and constantly striving and never being good enough throughout um, the book um, and then obviously sadly he takes takes his life but you see um, little accounts of him uh, ruminating and dwelling on performances and that feeling of never being good enough and being severely anxious in in goals and um you would you, for him presenting you would never have known maybe that he was um suffering from issues of mental health because he put on such a good show he was always smiling if you look at pictures of him he was you know, smiling, happy, um, and then he he takes his his life. So, um, I think a lot more has to be done. And I'm actually um, running a project right now where I'm looking at um, personality and in professional football and whether that predicts uh, mental health and suicide suicide ideation. Um, so I'm getting professional footballers, so I'm recruiting, um, to look at that and see if our personality and being high in perfectionism is likely to impact people's thoughts of suicide and depression. Um, and that way, if we can, we know outside of sport that this is the case. Um, if you're, you're high in perfectionism, then it's linked to, to, to suicide or suicide ideation. Um, but we don't have anything in sport. So if we can then tackle um, the p- perfectionism and how people manage that and manage their expectations, then hopefully in turn we can help people feel good and not resort to that level. So it is something that I really worry about for, for professional footballers or any any footballers or any people. Um, but with more and more studies coming out that professional footballers are, um, you know, susceptible to psychological distress, you know, just as much or even more so than the general public, then... I think something has to be done um, and intervention is very, very important. Um, within my PhD, I ran an intervention and looked at self-help um, and whether that could help individuals reduce their perfectionistic thinking. So I should never make a mistake. Um, I need to be perfect. Um, so these types of thoughts, if we have them a lot, will lead to more negative emotions over time. Um, and whether giving someone just a resource to become aware of their perfectionism and aware of how their overthinking can impact them um, can then in turn help their emotions, so more negative emotions, and help reduce these types of thoughts. Um, So that's only one type of intervention, but there's so many that I think we have to start to embed and from a young age, just teaching people how to love themselves and have compassion towards themselves and be mindful and things like that. Yeah, I, um, I'd be very interested to, you know, to read that and to see that sort of research where speaking to the players to see if that did, there was like a direct sort of correlation between the two. Um, because I, when I spoke to 
uh, but I spoke to football journalist Phil Brown, um, and we sort of did a show on depression and grief, um, and he sort of told his sort of heartbreaking story about regarding his partner, um, and I discussed some of the things that I'd been through, <clears throat> um, and the when or the sort of one of the things that we both had in common was that we very much come from a way of thinking of keeping your emotions to yourself mm. and you know not sharing your sadness or your frustration or your upset um, and I think a lot of it is about changing that opinion and I think it is changing but I think there's still work to be done and it's almost like telling whether it's footballers or kids in academies or whoever that you know it's all right to not be okay and there's nothing wrong with sort of trying to talk through it and work out why you're feeling like it and what you can do to perhaps try and combat it and the more we can encourage people to do that the better mm -hmm. um, and I think particularly with sort of kids not just kids in academies just kids generally I think the more that we can teach them sort of healthy mental health well-being the better and I think if you teach them to manage it as they're sort of going into teenage years, by the time they come to adults, hopefully they'll be a bit better equipped, perhaps, than people who grew up, like myself, like 20, 30 years ago, who didn't, I wasn't equipped to deal with some of the issues that I had, mm -hmm. through no fault, really, of anybody, just that the way of thinking mental health then to now was way way different so yeah i think the more we can do to help children be prepared as they go into adulthood is the better it's a good thing obviously yeah i think um i teach um how to manage anxiety stress in schools um and just having kids um address or even talk or admit the types of feelings that they might have um, and lead up to exams um, and the majority of them will say that they are stressed out and they're anxious and knowing that you know anxiety no. then obviously the impact oh no gone but when it gets to the point of you know that it's impairing your feelings about yourself or impairing your performance then that's when it's not good so I find that um, what's useful about the sessions that I do is that kids just admit that they're not feeling a hundred percent or amazing and you know they're not expected to and it's okay to feel anxious and feel nervous and then give them techniques of how to cope and um, deal with the pressure of an exam and we talk about the pressures and things that they can draw upon to to help themselves um, so hopefully that's one way that we can, you know, start embedding these principles of psychology into to everyone that we can talk about emotions. Yeah, yeah, and it's I think it's getting people of all ages to understand that it's not a weakness to discuss your emotions or to discuss if you're feeling like you're struggling or it's getting on top of you. Um, so let's talk a bit about some of the work that you do. Um, the one thing I was going to ask you about actually was the, um, I was reading on your website about um, you sort of uh, looking into the relationship between sort of overthinking, perfectionism and then psychological dis distress. And as someone who gets quite bad anxiety, which is predominantly from overthinking everything um, and it can spiral quite quickly so I can be feeling all right and then I can go quite the other way quite quickly for no real reason um, that is something which interests me um, what could you tell me about that well um, I was I mean I've been interested in how our thought patterns impact from probably being an overthinker um, having perfectionistic thoughts as in I need to be perfect I can't make a mistake um, but also that rumination of things so worrying 
um, about things that have, have happened in the past. So dwelling on performances, thinking, oh, I should have done this better. I could have done that better. I should have done more. And then that comes with guilt. Or that worrying about how things will going to, are going to turn out in the future. So that forward thinking of worry, um, which then obviously in turn impact our emotions. So what I found in my studies is that uh, if you're high in perfectionism, but then you also have these cognitions, like this worry and thought about having to be perfect or what other people think of you. Um, I need, they think I should be perfect. I need to be perfect for them or these types of thoughts. Then people will more likely feel anxious, angry and dejected. So feel down. Um, and if that's not managed over time, I found that when I interviewed people that... Um, it would lead to psychological distress. So um, issues, anxiety, depression, self-harm, eating issues, um, all stemming from the fact that when they're not, when you're not perfect, you'll dwell on it, you'll overthink it, and then it becomes a cycle. So you make a mistake, you worry about the mistake, uh, then you worry about the next time that you could make the mistake, and then you feel rubbish, and then it becomes a cycle of rumination. So I found that's particularly with footballers um, if they make a mistake have a poor performance then there's a tendency to dwell in it on it and then worry and lead up to their next performance and then if they do well then it redeem you redeem yeah. yourself but if you don't do well then that worry and rumination is going to carry on to the next week and then the next week and the next week so if you think of having that anxiety and rumination over a long period of time like what's that doing for someone's overall well-being um, and I know from personal experience the time when I've played and I felt very anxious uh, probably depressed is when I was in an, when I played in America and I felt so much pressure that I put on myself um, I was constantly telling myself like they paid a scholarship for me I need to be the best they brought me over for this I need to do that um, mm. I can't make a mistake or they're going to send me back to Scotland. Um, so I had these cognitions in my head before I ha had any idea what sports psychology was. Um, and it would made me, make me really anxious, like so anxious that I didn't, I did performed the worst I've ever performed because I had put so much pressure on myself. And that then would impact, you know, my studies and everything else because I needed to be perfect. I needed to get A's. I needed to do the best in football. So probably I didn't enjoy being in America as much as I could because I had all these expectations of myself and yeah. it just made me depressed and anxious um, and then I found sports psychology and looking at cognitions and how to help people with these cognitions irrational thoughts catastrophizing worrying perfectionistic thinking and ways to just stop that thinking so um, I use like shut up and go on with it so if I realize that I'm like overthinking and going on and on in my head you know about something that's making me anxious yeah I just say shut up and go on with it and I try and use distraction techniques um so for performance I just learned to like on a match day I would um I would I would clean my flat so I would hoover I'd listen to music I would do anything that I needed to do that would distract me um and then probably like an hour and a half before I'd start to get into the mindset of okay I'm going to I'm, this is me going to perform now and I'd slowly build up my energy levels instead of being like the night before thinking about it and the morning thinking about it and then before you know it I'm at my game and I'm knackered because I've just been think, thinking about it yeah um so I think my shut up and go on with it's very good because I know that I have the tendency to overthink um or having ways to um you know, breathe through my anxiety or um, visualization, meditation, those types of things. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's interesting to me, like the the way sort of thought patterns work, and the way, like you say, the 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 almost vicious cycle of it all, where you go from being anxious about a performance, say, and then. It, you just go round and round in circles, and again, as like as a sportsman, then you, it's going to get worse unless you break the cycle by playing well, mm -hmm. which you know doesn't always happen because the anxiety makes you 
question your decisions making process or what you're doing how to prepare you know there's different ways that a whole host of different ways that that would affect or anxiety would have an effect on whether it's the preparation or the on-field decisions so if you were sort of seeing like a footballer who was in that sort of vicious circle of anxiety bad performance poor form negativity from fans or whatnot how would you help them to sort of break that cycle well for people that i've worked with before if it becomes like an in performance issue for example i had one um person who if they made a mistake in the game it would cost them about you know 15 minutes because their head would go down and then they would worry about it and then they would be lost in the game so for me i was would try and get them to um just let it go so let go of the mistake so sometimes you know i had one person that would pick up a bit of grass when we used to play grass throw the blade of grass and even though that you know may, t- may take 30 seconds it was much quicker than the 15 minutes that they were taking to um ruminate and worry about that mistake that they made um, some people they use other techniques like they have a um elastic band and they just try and let go it's like stop let go um, it might be like a some other trigger that they have that um you know like clapping hands or but pulling their sock up and um, so in performance um using triggers like that just to try and let it go as quick as possible and uh yeah almost try to trick your brain that nothing's happened because if you know if you look yeah. at the best the best players usually they're the ones that you can't tell if they've just made a mistake or not they're just playing no. at this level this constant level um and that's what i try and, and, and encourage that you know, the, the next thing that you do is you respond and you respond in a, a positive way. Um, if it becomes like a cycle of things, then we try and focus on good things that they've done and not just the one negative mistake. Because, I mean, if you think about football, there's so many uncontrollable factors. Um, you know, it's a game where it's, sometimes it could be very difficult to have a good performance. You've got your teammates, you've got the referee, you've got a bobbly park, you've got all these... Mm-hmm uncontrollable things and then um i use like sometimes um a bit like the significance um so to minimize the significance of it like so in the moment or out with like it's a game of football you know like no one's died um it's not the end of the world if i look down from the moon is anyone actually going to see this football game like no it's not that big a deal and there's been plenty of games where you've played well so let's look at the, that those aspects so i try and make it um, have a positive focus rather than just that constantly dwelling on, on the negatives and finding ways that they can look at their strengths rather than just everything they've done wrong. Yeah, I think I think as well, what people perhaps, so for like people who have, don't suffer with like anxiety issues, is I think what people don't realise sometimes is they think that they can't understand why, like I've had it a few times where I'm a bit better now, but like a couple of years ago, I was having like really bad anxiety attacks a lot. And a lot of it was linked to my physical health, which wasn't very good. But like some people, people just couldn't quite get to grasps. Like why, you know, they were just sort of like, oh, don't be stupid. And it's like, you can't explain it. But so it is very difficult. And I can imagine it's even more difficult trying to talk someone out of it because I know how difficult it is trying to talk myself out of it, let alone try and talk, you know, a stranger out of it or a footballer or someone. So I got, uh, I got sympathy for like sports psychologists and people who've got to try and break those cycles and change. Sometimes, like in some ways, you're trying to change the way you know, their thought patterns and the way they think about things which have happened on the pitch. Like you say, they may have made one mistake, but they also would probably would have done 20 good things in that game. But because they're so focused on not making a mistake and being the very best top-level sportsman, the 20 get almost pushed to the side and it's that one thing, which obviously... <clears throat> 
like that one thing might have left to a, led to a goal or like an important decision or incident, of course. But I guess it's trying to get people, get the players or the sportsmen to <clears throat> to try and weigh them up almost equally, so that you're not leaning too much one way. So it's almost trying to bring balance to the way they uh, where they address things and the way they think about things. Both in afterwards, but also in preparation for the next, you know, the next game, isn't it as well? Yeah, and that's where mistakes are are useful because we we then can find ways to rectify it or or learn from it. But the um, we often attribute mistakes to then not being good enough. Mm. And and I worked with a coach once, and I liked that he would he would reinforce before every single game to his players after we had discussions that mistakes are the only thing that you can um, accept is going to happen in, in football. Like, that's the one thing that you can guarantee. There are always going to be mistakes and everyone's going to make a mistake in football um, in, in a game, every single game. There's not going to be one person who has a completely per- perfect performance because it doesn't exist. And it's... I think that's what's different about football compared to other sports is that um, a lot of things are subjective. So if you've got your a subjective tendency just to think that you always play poorly, um, whereas in other sports you can obviously get a ten or you know get you get scored um, objectively. But for for football, you know you've got your goals, and otherwise, how do you evaluate your performance, and what do you see as the best or perfect or mistake free um, and often not you won't be able to get that <laughs> no <laughs> yeah you know it's it's um, a <clears throat> like like I said right at the start of the show is um, mental health generally is so complex and there's so many little intricacies um, situational things which impact it and emotional things which impact it past you know behaviors and experiences everything sort of combines to make this big thing of your mental health so it's a very difficult thing to manage and i think the more help that people get generally not just sportsmen the more help you can get give people to manage that um whether it's to manage mental health issues or just to maintain healthy mental health well-being is a good thing and i just like I say, I hope that more clubs and leagues and sports will do more to help the players, sportsmen, uh, manage these things and, you know, just, like I say, prepare for after their career now, which is only going to make, it's only going to have a positive impact on their mental health now as well because they'll feel like they're prepared for when they're career ends whether it ends so like if they feel like oh if my career ends tomorrow i can do this if it my career ends in 15 years when i'm 34 then i'll still be able to do this or i've got this to fall back on or i've got my coaching badges so i think the more support for people overall but sportsmen is good yeah and i think if we it's difficult because of the pressure that then even managers or coaches have that they have to get results or they have to you know do this to stay in a job because they obviously have the same pressures if they don't do well and produce results then they're going to have the same thing so even for them and their own mental well-being you know having um, resources for them and having support for them um, so that they can um, talk about their their mental health and their anxieties because I know that it's quite um it can be reflective can't it if you're if you have a perfectionistic anxious coach then that can fuel fuel the feeling of a team um and can impact people's responses so if we can also support coaches and managers to feel um that there's not so much pressure on results and more about how do you develop people in a team and develop you know a squad and develop individuals as human beings then there's less pressure to you know have to have so many points and so many trophies and so I feel like 
bad for coaches and managers because they're under so much pressure and and by fans and they're uh, chucked out you know if they've not done so well and then it's trying to get another contract and yeah it's a it's a, a very pressurized world oh god yeah i mean I, I guess with at least with the players unless they sort of get a career if they're ending injury they've got a contract for one year or two years or three years and unless they do something really bad they don't get sacked they might mm-hmm. got sold and they still got a contract somewhere else whereas a manager and a, co- a coaches you know if they ever run a bad results which is technically to a certain point out of their hands anyway because they don't play they just organize and you know set up the play and the team and whatnot which obviously they have a say in how the team does but ultimately it's down to whether those players perform you know a lot of the majority of top teams now if you lost you know eight out of ten games they'll be looking over their shoulder probably going to get the sack so Mm -hmm. yeah i didn't even think of it from a coach's point of view i went in sort of looking more from players and stuff and yeah, I can, could do an, could do another hour about managers. <laughs> but, um, thank you so much, Tracy, for joining me. I really do appreciate it, and thank you for finding time in your hectic schedule to spare me an hour or so. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Um, thank you for tell the me. So, right, no worries. Tell the people where they can find you on social media and your website. So my website is believepositivepsychology.com. So that's my, my website. Um, I'm on Instagram is T Dawn Believe B no, sorry, T Dawn underscore be positive. Um email address if you want any questions, Tracy underscore Donicky at hotmail.com. Um, I'm on Twitter at T Donna005. Um yeah. Ask cool. me any questions. And Indeed. if there's any professional footballers that want to fill out a survey for me, get in, t- get in touch. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'll, uh, I'll, I've, uh, the people I'm going to speak to are more ex-players, I think. But um, if you want them to fill it in, I'll get them to fill it in for you. <laughs> That's not a problem. When I interview them over the next couple of weeks, uh, you can find us on uh, under Ace Podcast Nation on Facebook. On Twitter is at AceCast underscore Nation. Uh, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, which is youtube.com backslash C backslash Ace Podcast Nation. Uh, and if you hit the bell, you'll get a notification every time we upload content. Uh, we've also got audio now for all the previous previous episodes on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and podcast.co, uh, where you can download these shows. Uh, please drop us a comment on YouTube. Facebook reviews on iTunes always good to help spread the word and get ears and eyes on our content. Uh, thank you again to Tracy and thank you again to everyone for watching. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.